is, in fact, the Data Collab Lab uh, with Franco and Denny, and today is Automate Data Pipelines with PySpark SQL with Austin Young and Hector uh, Caminara. And we actually are live on YouTube as of right now, even though we're three minutes early. So uh, for all of you who are wondering what the heck you're doing and why you logged in, now you know why. Um, if you want to go ahead and chime in uh, on the uh, chat and let's know where you're from. Uh, we, we got Carlos from Spain, that's pretty sweet. Uh, where else are you guys from? So we just talked about this right before you came back, but I am in the Chicagoland area. I'm out in the western suburbs of Chicago. Um, I grew up, I was born and raised here. What about you, Austin? I live in Chicago now, but I'm from uh, Los Angeles, California originally. So go Lakers. We'll see what happens with that. Hopefully they don't uh, mess up against the Nuggets now, but we'll see. Hector? Yeah, can you guys hear me? Sorry, yep. I, had a, I had a delay. Uh, uh, yeah, so this is Hector Camarena, um, Solutions Architect for Databricks, and I'm actually based out of Minnesota. Um, prior to Databricks, uh, I, so I've been in Minnesota my whole life pretty much. So I, I worked at uh, Target Corporation here, which is huge. We worked on a big data platform uh, team, which is, you know, consisted of a Duke cluster of a thousand nodes. Um, it was very interesting back then, right? All the ecosystems that I worked with. Um, and then I joined the consulting world um, in, in you know, a company called PH Data. Uh, and again, it focused around Hadoop and Spark. Um, and one thing led to another and I found myself with Databricks. Um... Everything has changed on me. Yeah, yeah sorry, I just uh, figured I stopped the share just because I figured we actually are live now. So there's no point saying starting soon since we've technically already started. <laughs> no, Denny, I was talking to Dave about, I was asking him to help us out before this and he had a great idea. Oh, sure, he what's up? That? that with my, with my over-exaggerated hair, do you mm -hmm. remember the character from the, the 90s TV show Beekman's World? Oh, yeah, absolutely. He said, I should blow out my hair, get uh -huh. a lab coat, and then just do like a Beekman's World type thing. Oh, we should so change this entire show for that. Okay. Uh, do you, remember? I, you know what? Do I have polling? Can I actually? Oh, should we ask that question here? Let me ask that question for everybody. How about, uh, can how I do about, it? Oh, darn it. No, we can't. <laughs> I don't know if I've got good enough acting skills. He was super emphatic, like just another level emphatic. I don't know if I could replicate that. No, no, no. You don't necessarily have to actually be like that emphatic, but the, the, I think the call out is that at least if we were to start wearing lab coats yeah. and then, you know, and then you get the hair going, right? I think we can at least go ahead and stylize ourselves that way, right? So for, for your folks who are wondering, uh, we may be dating ourselves massively, okay, by referring to Beekman's world, or at least Franco and I am. So if you have no idea what we're talking about, we'd like to apologize in advance. What do you think? I, I think that's probably valid on our part to do that. So nevertheless, uh, let's jump on starting the show. Um, we have some folks from India, from Sunnyvale, from Seattle, and of course, Chicago, which is great. Um, and people are wondering, is this, uh, what is this session and it, it, will this session be available on YouTube? It is currently on YouTube Live. It's recording on YouTube as we speak. And so even if you decide that you need to jump out uh, for the session, uh, by all means you can, because we'll, we'll prop it onto the Databricks YouTube channel uh, to your heart's content. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, by all means, please go ahead and chime in using the chat and Q and A. And for that matter, uh, also for those on YouTube live, we will be monitoring that as well. So be, let's start the show. This is the Data Collab Lab. Today's session is Automate Data Pipelines with PySark SQL. My name is Denny Lee. I'm a developer advocate at Databricks and a guy that also happens to like to hawk the fact that I'm a co-author for Learning Spark, the second edition book. All right, Franco, why don't you go next since you are the star of the show, especially if we blow out your hair on the Beekman's, uh, uh, the Beekman style. <laughs> I don't know about that, uh, but you know, we'll give it a shot. My name is Franco Patano. I'm an enterprise solutions architect out here in the Chicagoland area. Um, I help clients figure out how to take their data projects and turn them into data products in the cloud using the Databricks Unified Data Analytics Platform. Um, one of the things that I 
uh, engage with a lot with uh, prospects and clients and people in the field and the community is nowadays in this new world, uh, the collaborative features of our platform are actually more interesting to people than a lot of the other stuff that, that our product and platform has. So I decided to talk to Denny about, hey, let's get on the community and do like a lab or something. So here we are, Data Collab Lab. And uh, this is another episode. We are joined here by Hector and Austin, who are going to help us uh, figure out. We learned a couple new tricks lately mm -hmm. and uh, how to automate data pipelines with some old tricks. And we want to share that. Uh, with that, you know, uh, let's take it over to Austin. Hey, everybody. My name is Austin Young. I'm a consultant at Slalom Consulting out of the Chicago area. And I'm a member of the data and analytics practice there, where I focus mostly on data engineering and ML engineering. And so coming into this, we're going to be doing a mixture of Python and SQL. So really excited to dive into it. And it's pretty technical. So buckle in. Yeah. And again, sorry, I jumped the gun earlier. So sorry for the people that aren't early. But yeah, again, it's Hector Camarena, Enterprise Solutions Architect, just like Franco. He's my colleague. We work together. And again, yeah, we do help out uh, customers that really are looking to go into that modern architecture on the cloud. Um, so I'm excited. My background's in Hadoop and Spark. Um, so yeah, I joined uh, Austin and Frank Franco on the on the fun. Uh, nice to meet you guys. Awesome. Thanks for those intros. So uh, let's talk a little bit about what we're going to do today, or maybe the problems that you know a lot of the of the people that have in the field today when migrating to the cloud. You know, a lot of times Austin and I and Hector have been talking about like what clients or prospects or people in the, in the industries are, what kind of problems they're having. And we've noticed a couple of uh, interesting, oh, Dave joined us. Uh, we also have an extra guest today who will be helping us answer questions. So on our last episode, um, there were a lot of questions and it was hard for us to keep up. So we asked Dave to help us out. Dave is, uh, uh, I'll have him introduce himself. Hi, I'm Dave. Um, I'm a, also a solutions architect um, at Databricks. Um, I'm a little late, um, you know, customer obsessed, uh, was helping out a customer and uh, join, uh, lucky that, and happy to join you guys. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Dave is uh, our like local data scientist expert for the Chicagoland area. So if you have any, you know, really tough questions, uh, please feel free to, to hassle him on the chat and Q&A. Um, just kidding. But uh, one of the common themes that we, we come about is data engineering. And then, you know, having to, what we find is that there's these same patterns that happen over and over and over again. And when an organization has like their design pattern down, you're essentially just using the same components um, and it's just different tables, different names. So we actually found this, this trick of using dynamic SQL inside of Databricks to automate our pipelines. Um, so the problem is, uh, you know, how do we take all of this data and bring it into our ecosystem, whatever your data platform looks like, and, and allow it to be consumable? But how do you engineer that data with uh, as, as kind of efficiently as possible? Austin, do you want to talk a little bit about like how and any perspectives in the field that you have with problems like this uh, that, that you've kind of seen and, and how customers have struggled with it or how people that you engage with struggle with it? Yeah, definitely. So I think that the original way that this came up was thinking about data coming in in sort of a streaming way where you have a lot of different schemas in formats like JSON, Avro, things like that, and also in nested schemas that are kind of gross. But you generally know what your consumption layer is going to look like. You, you know like what the data needs to look like in its final form to actually use for analysis and things like that. So if you have a bunch of, say, IoT fitness watches, that sort of thing, and they pass in just a bunch of different data sets, one of them may be tracking things like, okay, your total calories burnt or your heart rate, things like that and total time on a run, you know, those sorts of things. That information comes in a sort of streaming way and sometimes in different schemas, which really complicates your entire process here. You know, it's coming from the same device in a way, but in a bunch of different ways. And so you come into this question of, okay, you have a lot of schemas that are similar, but still different. How do you wrap your data engineering around this device or machine in such a way that you can use like one notebook, it's fully parameterized, but you can ingest and work with all of your schemas, you know, seamlessly. And we're, we're going to talk a little bit about how you can do that in Databricks because Databricks is really opening the door in a lot of ways on the data engineering front for fully parameterizing your workflows, things like that. 
I could use one notebook to run 50 different tables just by using parameterization. So what if like the data structures are nested? What if you have like complex nested types? How like, it, it doesn't that bring a kind of a, a you know, a, an interesting tangle into the whole process? Yeah, and somehow, somehow, sort of ironically enough, that turns into the easiest problem to solve when you're using something like Spark or uh, on Databricks. And I know that sounds sort of crazy, but there are built-in functions that handle that sort of thing really nicely. As long as you have a good grasp of fundamentally what your schema looks like, there are, there are functions for that. And uh, one of them is like the explode function. One of them is uh, dot star formatting, which we'll demonstrate in a bit. But, you know, that's actually not the hard part. I think it's dynamically extracting your consumption schema is the hardest part. Hmm. That's interesting. I wonder if there are any tricks for that. Hector, what, uh, what have you seen out there? Like, what have you heard in the field about uh, this type of things or challenges that, that people have with uh, data engineering? Yeah, so actually, you know, prior to Databricks, this is the world that I was in, right? Uh, I, I use Spark and Scala specifically. Uh, and when, it's, when you talk about different sources, right? Like, let's say 30 tables, 30 different tables, right? What I had to do and the, you know, the most time consuming thing wasn't even the code itself. It was more of a creating us, you know, those struct types, the schemas, right? Like manually creating everything, right? Uh, creating case classes in, in Scala. Um, so just creating, imagine 40 tables with each table being a hundred rows, right? Um, I spent a whole week just creating those type of formats and structure, for, you know, what, before re reading the, the tables, right? Uh, and then you have to map it to that schema that you created manually. Um, very time consuming, very painful. If, you know, if you on any, any new source, you had to, you know, create a new struct type with the correct schema, right? That was one of them. Another issue was if you do read it and if there's ever a change in the schema or if there's ever new additions or subtractions from the fields, uh, right? I had to test and validate every single output, right? I had to make sure the schema within my code match the output, right? Uh, the table, the table, the, the destination source, right? Which was another, you know, three weeks of creating tests and validation, right? Um, so overall, right, it, it's doable, but it's really time consuming to do, you know, what we're gonna show today um, in the real world um, without some of the cool tricks and, and, and tools that um, we'll show today, so. Awesome. Thanks, Hector. Well, let's let's get into it. Uh, let's collab. Let's collaborate on the on the notebook. Uh, Austin, do you want to share your screen and kind of take us through it, and then we can kind of go into the notebook and see what's going on? Yep. Let me know when you can see my screen. Also, just to let everybody know that we will be using the community edition of Databricks today. So this is if you want to launch your own, uh, you know, test this out yourself. Uh, we will be sharing content after the episode. But you yourself, this is completely free. Uh, the, the community edition of Databricks, um, you get uh, a 15 gigabyte cluster. It's got two cores on it for absolutely free. So you can go in and try all these things yourself. Um, you know, it's very simple to get started. So just to let, let you know, that's what we'll be using today. In community edition, we are limited to three concurrent users. So it's just going to be me, Hector, and Austin in the notebook today. So take it away. Perfect. Thanks, Franco. So as you can see, I've got my community edition open right here. So I'll give you all a quick overview of what we're actually gonna do here today. So essentially I have two JSON files and they both have completely different schemas. And I'm going to, in this one notebook here, basically parameterize it in such a way that I can ingest the JSON, I can apply my consumption schema, I can drop duplicates for my first file and then I'm just going to run it entirely for the second one. And it's, it's going to be as, as hands off as possible. So in short, I'll, I'll give you a quick rundown of what the data looks like. It's very basic. It's just this very simple JSON, fi uh, JSON file, it has a user ID, your total number of calories burnt, like I mentioned and how IoT devices come in, number of steps, miles walked, a timestamp and the device ID. Very straightforward. Once you flatten this out, it's only four rows, but there is a duplicate in there that we're going to remove. And additionally, we actually have a create table that, that let's say that it's coming from a legacy system you need to know what your um, consumption schema is ultimately going to look like. So this schema is actually different than what the, the inferred schema will be in a bit. And that's primarily on this timestamp right here, it comes in as a timestamp and I added a new field just as an example. So if your consumption schema is different from your, your starting JSON file, it doesn't matter. This is flexible and this is going to work either way. Wait, so, so you said yeah. inferring schema, did I hear you correctly? 
we'll get to that. That's coming up in just a second. All right. Oh, oh by the way, sorry. Uh, just to chime in real quick, we got a real quick request. Uh, can we zoom in on the notebook just a little bit more so folks can sure. actually see it? Like, go ahead, one twenty-five or one fifty percent, please. I think that should work. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. And so, thanks to the folks on YouTube Live for calling us out on that. We should have remembered this one. So, our bad. <laughs> yeah. So, but before we kind of get further, uh, dynamic SQL. I just want to define it real quick. Uh, it's a pretty, it's a, it's an older uh, trick that's been used in the SQL realms, actually only if the language had a programmatic extension because SQL by itself does not actually support. Um, so it, it's not like a, 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 com a Turing complete language. Uh, there were uh, organizations that actually built that in. Uh, Oracle built PL SQL on top of their SQL syntax. Uh, Microsoft built T-SQL on top of there. So essentially, there were abilities to create this, uh, you know, decades ago. Uh, we're going to be actually using Python to generate our SQL statements, and we're going to be using PySpark with uh, these things to kind of automate our pipelines. So that's what dynamic SQL is. Essentially, it's an old trick to create uh, SQL statements dynamically at runtime with variables. So take it away, Austin. Yeah, exactly. And it you, you might have some familiarity with this idea of passing variables in between two programming languages, like going having um, a variable in Python and put and pushing it into SQL effectively. We're going to go a little bit further than that. We're not just moving variables. We're taking text extracts out of files effectively and using it to dynamically change our queries. And you'll, you'll see it in a bit. So to start this whole thing off, I do initialize a couple parameters here. And the reason for this is if you were to put this into sort of a production workload and you had to make a lot of jobs in Databricks, you would use something called uh, notebook parameters. And what that would do is it would effectively tell you which schema it's supposed to apply here. So all of this is just saying, you know, I have two files here. One is my calories burnt IoT file and one is my average heart rate IoT file. Similar schemas, but different. Additionally, I'm just initializing where I actually want to store this once I load it in. And I'm just calling it DB sample files for this uh, example here. So I'll just run through this stuff really quick just to make sure it catches everything. And so you can see the first table we're starting with is calories burnt and then DB sample files. So at this point, you know, I in a normal circumstance, you might be using more of a cloud, a cloud storage based solution like an S3 bucket or Azure blob storage, something like that. But um, so we're actually just going to download these directly from the internet using shell. And so just run this really quick wget function. And you know this, this is just pulling in my JSON files and my create table text file statements that are from my legacy system that I'm going to use for my consumption schema. After that, I'm just double checking in shell that these actually loaded in. And then I'm using the great dbutils file system um, module in Python to move these into an appropriate area. So awesome. my file, go ahead. Th this is awesome. Is that because uh, just to kind of put a little color on there, uh, when you use wget, you're on the driver of the cluster, and you have to essentially use the DBFS is kind of cluster storage. It's per it persists to S3 because if a cluster goes down, you still want to have that data. In this instance, it persists to S3. It'll persist to object store depending on which cloud provider you're on. But essentially, what we need to do is take the file from the driver that used the Python function, and we need to put it on DBFS, and that's what we're doing here. Uh, so just wanted to, to explain a little bit of that um, as, as we're walking through here. Yeah, exactly. And I, you know, when you're running this sort of thing in a cloud-based storage, it's a little bit less complicated, really, because you don't have to go between the shell and Python switcheroo type thing. And it's only because shell and Python, they're sort of working in different spots. One is on the driver, as Franco just said, and the, other, and the Python one is on the file store, object-based file store already. So just to confirm that we actually have these things loaded in here, boom, there they are. So I've got my, uh, my folder which contains my JSON files, my folder, which contains my JSON files, and my create table statements for my consumption schemas. And then also, when we normally talk about the Delta architecture, what would be what in what we would put out as the consumable for this, if you were on Databricks, uh, what we would consider that steps would be bronze. And we would normally be using autoloader because it's already in cloud object store. Autoloader provides another efficiency on top of Databricks. It's a part of the Databricks platform. It's included with the product. What Autoloader does is that in the cloud, everything is metered. So everything has a cost to it, even transferring files. So in what we do, a very common theme with Spark Structured Streaming is just leave the file there, 
take uh, the like the location and keep a checkpoint directory. Essentially, it's the checkpoint process of structured streaming. So we're not actually going to move the file to manage its state. We're just going to keep track of the file in like a, a checkpoint process. Um, and Autoloader extends that. Essentially, uh, instead of listing directories on object store, which as directories grow, so if you have streaming use cases or batch use cases that are continually adding to that directory, the cost to just list the directory, it, it gets more over time. So what, we, what we've done is we actually used to help a lot of clients with this. They used to build the, the infrastructure on their own where they would put a notification service on the, the file, the object storage location, the directory. And then that notification service would store a message in a message queue on the cloud provider. And then structured streaming would agree for that message queue. This was terribly complex for, for our customers to set up. For our more advanced uh, collaborators built it themselves. So we essentially said, well, we should build that into Databricks. And that's what Autoloader is. Instead of just listing the files in a directory to find out what files you need to ingest, we just use the notification and the message queue, uh, and it's much more efficient. And it, 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 you, with structured streaming and Delta Lake transaction uh, log process, it allows for this really efficient ETL processing. Yeah, perfect. Use the tool before and it's great. Um, so now we can get into like the real, the real meat of the conversation, which is how do you actually dynamically extract schemas? And this is sort of an interesting thing that you have to do here because what you're going to see is we're using structured streaming. The primary issue, and I, would, I don't know that it's really an issue, the biggest call out with structured streaming is that you have to pass the schema when you actually read the screen, the stream. So what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm doing sort of a hacky method to infer the schema that I'm going to ultimately read with a stream. So what we do here is I pull out one of my JSON files and I use read instead of read stream. And I use the dot schema attribute and I basically log that. So I now have the schema that was inferred by Spark and I'm going to use that in my stream when I, um, when I run that in a moment, in my actual ingest stream. And this is, this is very cool because although an inferred schema might not be perfect, as you'll see a timestamp is going to come in as a string in a moment, it's, it gets the data in there and you can start doing more tricks to cast or you know, merge the schemas, things like that, that we'll get into in a bit as well. And so just to display what this, this data structure actually looks like when it comes in initially, it just looks like this. You have nested, nested, nested uh, file structure right here. So two structs in an array. And it's just this, uh, I don't want to call it nasty looking, but pretty nasty looking JSON file. And we're going to fix that immediately upon ingest. So, uh, yeah. so uh, a couple of quick questions. So when, uh, when we use schema inference, um, it, it, on a large directory, if you have a, a lot of files, it could get expensive, right? Because you have to basically in, investigate, you know, it has to scan all those files. There's a couple different options. You can use sampling ratio to sample a portion of the data. And that way it'll be more efficient because there's going to be a lot of stages that get spawned from it, this, this task, right? So we want to make sure that if, we, if it's too much, we don't have to infer the whole set. Uh, we can do sampling ratio just to sample a subset. But the whole goal here is then we can just use uh, spark.read to infer our schema. Um, and then we can customize that. And then we can use that schema, and then pass it over to structured streaming to kind of allow us to quickly iterate with our data engineering tasks without to have to write everything out up front, which helps you automate these tasks, right? And that's what we're, get, we're going towards here. Yeah. Exactly. And so, you know, we, I basically demonstrated how you pull out the sort of hacky inferred schema using spark.read and that's because you can't do it with spark.read stream. So just to show off, this is where I'm going to be pulling the JSON file really quickly from like for the streaming task here. And so this is, this is quite a bit of code. So I'll walk through it before I, uh, before I actually do it. So we're going to import the call and explode functions. That's going to help us with the nesting, the unnesting that we're about to do upon ingest. So very first thing, when I'm trying to read in this data structure, I have to pass the simple read stream with the format in JSON, letting it know in this case it's multi-line. So sometimes you'll get an error if the JSON is sort of in a funky format. So just doing multi-line true helps with that. And then you'll, you'll wanna take that schema file that I extracted up here that looks like this and just put it right into the, the read stream. And what that allows it to do is it's going to finally, it's going to allow it to actually load in the stream because you wouldn't be able to. Otherwise, like you have to have a schema in there to use read stream. 
at that point, you know, I tell it which what the location is that I'm going to use, which is the, this uh, DB sample files calories burnt location. And then I get into the really nifty stuff, which is automated unnesting. So there's two ways I'm going to do this here. The first one is with dot star formatting. That's specifically for structs. And then there's the explode function, which is specifically for arrays. And these are similar, of course, but different. Arrays oh, sort of. Go ahead. I was about I was about to say uh, for everybody who's online, want you make sure to remind uh, what a struct is because some folks might not actually remember what that is. Yeah. So the struct in this case is it has curly brackets. Oh my gosh, it has curly brackets here, and it's it's sort of like dictionary type format. And then an array is more like a list. It lists things out in an order. Perfect. Thank you very much. Perfect. And so the crazy thing is I can run all of these functions at once in the same command, in the same stream. So I, I put in my inferred nested schema, which is great. And then in the middle of this ingestion process, I am unnesting using this dot star formatting. So that unnests my data struct. Then I essentially say I, my new column results is going to be the exploded list of results. And what that does is it's going to make the actual rows. And then I'm going to once again, unnest it again with dot star um, right here. And that's going to spread it out among a, a bunch of different columns. So probably easier to just show you what this looks like since I'm writing it out to a normal, uh, I'm just writing it, or, um, writing it out to, I'm calling it the ingest folder. So after this trigger once structured stream goes, we'll have a Delta table that is at Wait, least in one form. One. Uh, let, let's talk about that for a minute. Yeah. Trigger once is interesting, right? Because we're talking about streaming, right? And people normally automatically default like all oh, real-time streams. Uh, do I really need real-time streams? Uh, not right now. My business isn't asking for it, but you know what? I kind of feel like streaming is the future. Like people are going to want things. My business is always asking for, can, can I get it faster? I've got daily loads. Can I get hourly loads? We've got hourly loads. Can I get it every minute? Like they're always asking to speed up the data loads. And a lot of times, like maybe your vendor, the where you're getting the data from only updates it every day. So it's really like, well, the frequency from the source, but sometimes the frequency from the source is updated more frequently. So what, what we do here, we're really leveraging structured streaming for a couple of core components, basically managing stuff so we don't have to. A major part of that is the state the state of the, of the processing of the data, right? Normally people maintain this in their own state stores, uh, maintaining it in a separate database, more complex architectures with, with ETL pipelines, with structured streaming, it has its own state store. It uses the checkpoint directory to manage where it currently is in the stream. And there's a lot of engineering marvel behind this whole concept. But what we're doing here is we're telling it, you know what, don't do uh, I just saw is this Spark 3. Structured streaming is actually Spark 2. Uh, this specifically does, we are using DBR runtime with Spark 3. But essentially what we're doing here is we're using structured streaming, but it's not real time. Um, what, what, uh, what the trigger once does is it says, you know what, wake up, when the cluster wakes up, like when we schedule a job and the cluster gets turned on, it's gonna process everything in the queue and then it's gonna shut down. Meaning it's like an ETL job, but it's using the streaming protocol to manage state for us. And then when we get to Delta, we're gonna be showing how we're gonna be essentially using Delta tables as a sync. Um, and then if you use the Delta architecture, it's used as a sync and source through the architecture pipeline. But essentially these components all work really well together. So it all keeps track of where you left off so that A, a very big on-prem thing to do to manage state is to move the file after you process it, right? Move it from new to processed or whatever words you like to use. Um, in the cloud, moving, file co moving files costs money, right? Everything is metered. So we don't really want to manage state by moving files. Structured streaming manages that for us. And the beautiful part about this is if you ever have to reprocess all of your data, you just change the variables of your, of your table names, right? Because you don't want to overwrite the same spot. But if you want to start from scratch, you remove the checkpoint directory or you rename it to another location, it'll recompute everything from scratch again. So reprocessing from the start isn't really a big deal anymore because we can boot up a new cluster, change the checkpoint directory, and we can reprocess from, from the start of time. So really amazing features here. And you know, if you notice, not very verbose code in 13 lines of code, 
we Austin has crafted together this this framework that essentially manages all of that complexity. One last yeah. thing. One last thing, I would, if I may, too. It, it's really a paradigm shift for you know structured streaming. Um, you, like you, with customers that I work with, right? Even if it's a batch job, right? I I, I go with structured uh, read stream. Sorry, structured streaming. Um, and again, just because what Franco said, right? You can just do a trigger once, and it's still a batch job, but it's really flexible. And I've seen that pay off with customers, especially when we're you know we're getting started and and they don't understand you know how fast the team wants it or they've never seen a, a tool as fast as Spark, right? Um, so, you know, their their expectations were not so much until they see how fast it is. And they're like, oh, okay, well, let's speed things up. Um, so yeah, usually it's, uh, and those of you who use Spark already, it's, you know, it's, it is a data frame API, right? So you, if you're familiar with that, then you're gonna be familiar with uh, structure streaming as well, so. Oh, and, <laughs> oh, oh, go ahead and go. go. Okay, cool. No, I was about to exactly add to everybody else's point. Like there, the the paradigm shift, it sounds like, you know, when we use words like that, it sounds like we're doing marketing buzzwords, right? And, but really it actually is a shift in thinking because when you go with trigger once, just that simple concept, right? What you're able to do is not just reduce the cost of file movement, but you're also able to reduce the cost of the clusters that you're using as well. You don't actually have to keep all your clusters or much larger clusters running at all times. You can shrink down the size when you don't need as many, you can increase. And so we actually have cases of customers that where they had like a 10X decrease in price, 10X decrease in VMs, just because they went ahead and did the shift. So, and in a lot of the cases, it wasn't originally even a streaming process. It's just that they had a lot of data. That's all it was. They just had a lot of data from multiple sources so in, in fact, using that structured streaming trigger once concept made it easier because they also went from having originally 80 different pipeline jobs down to three, right? So easier manageability, lower costs. So this is why we like are, again, it's a little bit too markety, but why are we using words like paradigm shift? Because you're reducing the cost of storage, reducing the cost of the clusters, you're reducing uh, the overhead of running all this stuff. And so, and then back to Franco's point about also the reprocessing, it's not just about reprocessing. It's also about, hey, maybe I need to build, uh, and for my buddy Gregory, who's actually online here, he was always talking about, you know, building a different Power BI cube against the data. Sure, right, maybe you have to design a new schema, but, well, and it needs to go back in time. Well, you don't need to mess with the original data modify Austin's code just a little bit, like, you know, uh, and then reread the entire thing, except this time, put it into a different Delta table with a different Delta, with a different schema, and boom, now try your Power BI cube on that and you're good to go, right? So it allows you to actually easily replicate, especially when we're talking about, you know, uh, clones of Delta tables too, but that's me going way off course now. But the context is that we, because we have a lot of these options in place, it allows you to actually get these things up and running significantly faster for a cheaper price. Okay, now I'm, I'm gonna get off my soapbox, so I apologize for that. <laughs> That's awesome. One last thing. So when you're ready, when your business is ready to go to a real time stream, it's just a quick code change, right? You can either A, schedule the job that this runs on more frequently. So if it's a daily load, change it to run every hour, right? Or if you need it to run like, with much lower latency, maybe, I don't know, every five minutes, you basically just change the trigger to be every five minutes. And then, you have, then you'll have an always running cluster, but then there's no major code changes, right? It's just a simple flag change or a couple lines of code, and then you're real-time streaming. So you're, you're getting efficient ETL today in the cloud, and then you're getting future capabilities when your business and when your vendors are all ready for near real-time streams. All right. Let's, let's go on. I think we've, we've talked about this one enough. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's so true. The, the moment you start seeing this interact in sort of a production environment where you're using jobs and scheduling, it, it's just a game changer. The fact that I can have one notebook and it's 50 different table schemas like that. It's really something else. So oh, I need to uncomment that. So I was just going to show you really quickly what this table looks like now after all the unnesting. It's exactly what you would expect in sort of a SQL style consumption layer. Now our yeah, only problem. I can, read, I can read the data. I can manipulate the data with SQL on a stream. Yeah. What? 
That's pretty nice. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty nice. So this is where we really get into the, the interesting part of sort of dynamic SQL and how you can use Python, PySpark really, and SQL kind of in this merged symbiotic relationship. So I talked a little bit about extracting, um, talked a little bit about taking a, a variable from Python and passing it into SQL, but we're gonna go even further than that. So I have these, I have these create table statements, which I had mentioned, and it's kind of an issue because my current schema has my timestamp as a string, which I'll, I'll demo in a second. And it also doesn't have this field in there. So if you go up really quickly, there's no sample string field in this version, but my consumption layer does have that field. And maybe I need to put like a marker, like a time marker in that field. It could just be one of those types of fields. So I'm, I'm gonna do something fun with regex. I'm going to take that, that text file that I have and I'm gonna make two uh, little, little strings that are gonna help me with my, my SQL queries in a bit. And of course, you know, it's, it's regex, so not every pattern is going to be the same, but if you have a general format for your schema text files that you're gonna use here, you'll be able to use the same regex at least across the board there. So what I'm demoing right here is just by using some simple regex, I was able to extract um, these relevant pieces of what would go into a SQL query uh, for my, my upcoming queries that I'm about to run. So this one is, this first one is what I call the create table uh, SQL extract. And this next one is just the, um, the fields that I want in my final consumption layer. So as you can see, I now have sample new field and I'm specifically changing timestamp to a timestamp. But this isn't changing the stream. This is the, the no. table definition, the destination, if you will, the table the table definition and the destination. Yeah, we're getting it into the table schema that we want for consumption. Mm, interesting. So this is this is where we get into it. This is where it really becomes dynamic SQL at this point. You see that I, I'm passing in four variables in a SQL statement, but they're not just variables. I mean, they're actual like pieces of SQL code that I extracted from my create table statements. And the beautiful thing about PySpark is I can just run it in a string in spark.sql. And what I'm doing here is I'm just creating a new Delta table that has the correct consumption schema. It's empty. It's just a new, a new table that I'm calling the parse calories burnt table. So I pop this up. I'll have a new table in the data section here. So you can see it right there, it's empty. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. So you just added a table dynamically. So basically it took that, that schema that you created, that, that you inferred uh, almost, and then it created a new table using the Delta syntax. So this is great for like migrations if you're coming from another system. Exactly. That's awesome. And sort of the test case here is if you had something that was sort of like a legacy Hadoop system, you can move it straight on to PySpark basically just using Python, SQL, and regex. Interesting. So if you have the table definitions already that your analysts or your data scientists are already using in another SQL-based system, you can just infer that schema, grab that schema, put it onto Delta Lake, and then does it infer types? Like how does typecasting work? Like did you have to manage all the individual types? So I don't really have to do much about the types in this case because our create table statement just had our final types in it but we're gonna get into something sort of interesting because our schemas are different right now. And I'll, I'll demo that down here. So I, I do have this mentioned already. So the first issue is that our timestamp in, um, in the ingest layer is a string. And I think, um, you know, we're all collaborating in here at the same time. <laughs> it's going to- So as, as a SQL user, if my data engineer is in here kind of creating the data. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. I need to check to make sure that this thing, this stuff is working right. How do I know that all of this gobbledygook code that you're coming up with in Python, how yeah. do I know that works gonna work for my SQL table? I can come in here and I can just start running my SQL statements to kind of validate what he's doing. And yeah, it looks like it's working. So, hmm, yeah. this is interesting. Yeah, that too. So I, I did wanna show this in, um, to actually call it out is that the timestamp is currently a string, but in our final consumption scale um, schema, it is a timestamp and we need to adjust for that. There's also an additional uh, field. So we're gonna use two tricks there. The first one is that timestamp, you know, if you, if you ingest it as a string, you should know that your timestamps are probably gonna have an issue. So we include the, the casting for that manually, but where it gets really interesting is the merge schema option. And what that means is, exactly. What that means is even though there, 
they're the schemas are different between the two. Like I don't, I'm missing a column in my first, uh, my ingest layer, my parse layer, my consumption layer has a, an extra field in it. I simply use this merge schema uh, option right here when I'm doing my new ingest and my timestamp conversion and boom, like it, it's sorted out and not an issue because I already created my uh, parse table with the correct schema in that previous step with the dynamic SQL. So I can run this really quick. All right, and this is exactly what I'm talking about is if I show you these. Oh, we now have a, a timestamp as a timestamp instead of a string, and we have a new field that wasn't in there previously. Huh, so it just handled the schema change? It just added it to the end of the table? Yep, just handled the schema change. Oh, uh, that's pretty That's pretty nifty. So yep. if, my, if my data source vendor is adding columns and maybe they don't tell me, you're telling me my if I enable this feature flag, it my ETL jobs won't fail. It just will add the column to the end of the table. Exactly. And we've seen this in actual data engineering projects. So yes. Wow. That's a pretty nifty feature. Add a column as needed. Yeah. As long as you as long as you change the consumption layer, you know, you're good to go. Or you know what your table's supposed to look like. And but by and large, people understand SQL more than they understand the data types between Python and all the other programming languages. So yeah. if they can if they can articulate in SQL what they want the data to look like, that actually makes your job as a data engineer simpler. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. All right, and so the last part of this is we're gonna run some deduplicate logic because I mentioned that there was a duplicate record in there. And so our record starts with four rows. It's gonna turn down to three rows, you know, spoiler alert. Just to, I just wanna demo this because, you know, this is a true like, we're using a merge into statement here that you'll see in a second. And it's sort of complicated at this point because I'm going to use both my create table logic and my, um, my the other uh, string that I used up here, which is called, what do I call it? Schema for query. So I'm gonna use both of these in, in the same thing. So, okay. my, so my first thing is I need to create my new Delta table, which is going to be empty, but with the final consumption layer schema. So very simple, you'll see it in, in here now, it's just an empty table. And now you get into a fairly complicated uh, SQL statement here with a lot of cool, um, a lot of cool variability and, and parameterization in here. So if you look up the way to do an upsert to Delta in Python, you should be able to find a reference for this uh, function called upsert to Delta. And so I'm basing this purely off of that. It should be referenceable. So what we're doing here is we wanna make sure we're checking for two things. We wanna make sure that our file that we're loading in doesn't have any duplicates. We also wanna make sure that it's not going to add any duplicates onto what's already in, in our um, final table. So, you know, in this case, I'm actually ingesting a file that has a duplicate. So I need to make sure that that file um, drops that duplicate. And I'm using a uh, row number over a partition. I'm using user ID and my device ID just as my, my key in this case. And I'm, I'm basically filtering it so that only the first record comes in. Fairly Can I simple. Add yeah. A little bit to this. So, yeah. um, a couple of pro tips that I've seen in the field. That this is so essentially what we're solving for here are a couple different big problems. A, I have duplicates in my set that is being merged into the set. So, I have duplicates in the merging set, and I don't want duplicates that are in my destination set from the source. So there's two problems being solved here with this nifty piece of code. And most, I, I wanna say, I did have an instance come up where someone used select distinct star and it wasn't getting the results they wanted because a distinct will do everything if it's distinct star. But if your keys are duplicate, but not all of the data is duplicate, it won't recognize them as duplicates select distinct. So that's why we're using this. And actually, row number over partition by is actually more efficient in, in most SQL engines. It's really efficient in Spark SQL. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing here is uh, some very nifty tricks to make our merge efficient. So essentially, uh, what we're doing here is don't insert duplicates into my destination set and also remove duplicates from my merging set. And it's all just this uh, nifty piece of code right here. Yeah, it's exactly what Franco just said. It, it really is awesome. Uh, 
and and I, I I would say that there's quite a bit of nuance to this whole thing, like he just described, because not being able to use distinct star because I only have specific primary key fields, it is you know sort of interesting. I should mention that when I when you see this more in production, this query usually is more complicated than this, just because within the the select star you know row number row number piece of the field, maybe you have to add additional fields in to do like timestamp checks and things like that. Like, oh, I loaded the data at this time. So normally there is a bit more nuance to this actual to this uh, query, but for all intents and purposes, this is probably the easiest way to, to demonstrate it. And, and if you want to know more about those, so that those are typically called like provenance fields in, in ETL data warehousing. Shout out to Denny and Douglas's previous chat, tech chats on this, but we do have videos covering specifically how to do those things with patterns similar to this. So if you want to know more about how to add in those types of fields, those provenance fields, definitely check out previous tech talks with Douglas Moore. He does talk about that and surrogate keys. So very good stuff there. Yeah, exactly. So I guess the two, two big call outs here is this, this function takes the data from my parse layer, removes all those duplicates and then merges it into my deduplicate table, which I made in the previous step. Um, I think the, the primary nuance of this is you have to make sure that your final schema matches your consumption layer schema. So that's why if I do this select star row number over partition statement here, I actually need to make sure I'm only selecting the right schema for the final layer. Cause I don't want my row number in there. I don't really, I don't really care about that in this case. So it's sort of like I'm removing a column from my final layer in real time, just so I have exactly what my consumption layer schema would have been. I think last thing to note on that is if you have a timestamp in your parse layer, what we had done up at the top, that's a way that you could speed this up as well. We've seen that because if, you, um, if you've previously loaded data, it's not necessarily important to double check your new, your new uh, it's, not, it's not necessary to go back on data that you've already checked for deduplicates uh, to reinsert. You know, it's just a waste of compute at that point. So maybe you put like a time filter at the end of this um, line right here. And then I think the last piece is output mode is update where we've been using append for the rest of this. Awesome, and the, the different types are update will update sets and then append will just keep adding to the, the sets as, as time goes on. Yeah. Um, so time check, Denny, I think we are at time right now. Is, is that about right? Yeah, I think we are pretty close to finishing. We can probably answer one or two more questions, honestly. And then I'm gonna take a little bit of time to, uh, to call out the, the next sessions that we also have. So maybe two questions. If you can squeeze it in, possibly. Let's Just a long they're short. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's take a look here. A lot of material, so. Yeah, it is. Squeezing it into a short period of time. Uh, oh, it, oh, it really oh, I was about to say, for starters, I, I know people are going to ask this question. So uh, they're going to ask where the notebooks are going to reside. Mm -hmm. There's a GitHub, Databricks Tech Talk GitHub, that we're going to put the notebooks into. So um, we're going to update the YouTube channel once we prop it in there. Okay, so just as a quick call out, that's actually where we put all the stuff. So um, so I'm not sure. I'll, I'll actually in the uh, chat, I'll go ahead and actually put a, a copy and paste the actual YouTube link. Oh, sorry, the actually I'll paste both the YouTube link and also the database GitHub. So that way you guys can work with it. But yeah, just as a quick call out, sorry, uh, I did figure out answer that question first, just because lots of people uh, ask those questions. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so a couple, if you have questions that you want answered, you know, we're here. Uh, for the community, reach out to us, uh, you mm -hmm. know, on social, um, and then we'll kind of, we'll, we'll set, uh, set up a meeting to discuss your, if you have a question that didn't get answered, reach out. But just a couple I want to, to, to hit on real quick. Hans says, schema, schema inference can be time consuming, can hide potential issues. You're absolutely correct. Uh, this, the, we're just showing you the, the tricks of the trade, right? Like you can, if you have the schema, you know, and if you're lucky enough to get it up front, Awesome, use it, right? Always use the schema if you have it. These types of things are just, you know, if you're given a task and you don't have the schema and you're expected to get going, this is just how you can start moving and you don't have to wait for schema because a lot of times you're not really giving it up front and you kind of just have to start working with what you have. So that's what we hear. So you're absolutely correct. If you have the schema, definitely use that first. You're gonna, it's gonna save you a lot of time and headaches in the long run. 
But just remember that even though if they give it to you up front, that doesn't mean that they're not going to change things as we, you know, that's why we have the whole merge uh, schema command is because, you know, data changes over time and, you know, new fields can come in. Um, Apu says uh, a little bit about streaming. So I, you know, Hector, I'm going to actually use, ask you, does Hadoop have streaming? I thought Hadoop, it, you used Spark structured streaming on Hadoop and that was like streaming. Or does Hadoop have its own streaming? Uh, well, you have the Spark APIs in Hadoop as well. And, you know, depending on what Hadoop you're using, it would depend on the support of the Spark that you're using. Um, so it does very, leverage Spark for streaming? Yep. All right. So yeah, so Hadoop would just be the, the underlying structure because I noticed you asked about HDFS and the next question, so if you're using uh, HDFS, it's indicative that you're either on-prem or you've got like an IaaS instance in the cloud where you, you're building your own kind of VM and you're installing everything. Um, we don't actually use Hadoop uh, on Databricks. We use Cloud Object Store as our persistence layer. And then we have DBFS as the kind of cluster storage. Uh, so it's a little bit different. But if you have on-prem, you can use open source structured streaming. You can use open source Delta Lake. So you can use everything in this notebook on your own on-prem open source, or if you have cloud IaaS instance, basically on your own fully managed ecosystem, you can leverage those technologies on top of Hadoop instead of, of cloud object store. It's just that uh, over here at Databricks, our engineers found that uh, working with cloud object store was just much more scalable and efficient in the long term. And that's just what we use uh, here. But you can, if you have your own infrastructure architecture, you can still use these components. With that, uh, Denny, you want to you want to take us home, buddy? You got it. No problem at all. So, hey, I'm going to share a screen for everybody, uh, just because. Um, so, actually, Austin, if you can cancel yours, so that way I don't explicitly knock you out. Sure thing. <laughs> thank you, sir. All right. So, for everybody, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you very much uh, for Austin and Hector uh, to join our show, and Dave for helping us to answer our questions. So, like I said before. This is today's is the Automate Data Pipelines with PySpark Speakle. We actually have more sessions coming up that we'd love you guys to join, okay? So first of all, there is this, the Bay, uh, next week is the Bay Area MLflow Meetup with Redis AI, NVIDIA, and Databricks. So it's a pretty cool session. So that'll be next Wednesday on the 30th. So that's why we actually don't have a regular st standing data and AI meetup, just because we're going, nah, this is a pretty good one. You guys should attend this thing, okay? All right, so... But shortly afterwards, there is going to be the next Data Collab Lab. Yes, Franco and I are back. And we're going to be going ahead and talking to Scribd, uh, how they use Delta Lake to enable the world's, world's largest digital library. So that's the marketing statement. Okay, so now what the, what the real statement is, the, the ones that you guys would enjoy, is we're going to discuss with the Scribd engineers on Delta Tables and the transaction log. It's with QP and Tyler. We're going to go deep, we're going to go technical, and it's going to get really, really geeky. And so, in other words, I hope you guys will, and gals come and join us because it's going to be a lot of fun, okay? So those are the next two sessions. And I, like I did, I called out inside the YouTube chat. I'm, I'm forgot, sorry, in the Zoom chat, I forgot to do in YouTube. So I'm gonna copy and paste this. Uh, once the notebooks are available, we're gonna prop it here. We're gonna add another folder here. I'm going to change this in the next couple of weeks, because this, as you can tell, we've got a lot of sessions with a lot of notebooks. So we're gonna re-streamline this and make it a little bit easier to read. Uh, but the context is that we actually put everything in this GitHub Databricks Tech Talks. Uh, so the, yes, the notebooks you see here today, they were running on Community Edition and we'll prop it all here so you can go and recreate the entire thing yourselves. And that's it really for today's session. Um, I did want to always give uh, Franco, then Austin Hector, the final words, just a, uh, any last words, any call outs that they'd love to go ahead and say. I just want to thank Austin and Hector for doing this. I really appreciate you guys, you know, uh, digging in and helping us share the message about how we're helping, uh, you know, organizations and people out there that are struggling with their data pipelines, how to automate them and, you know, understand that there is help out there. You guys have anything that you want to wrap up with? I just wanted to say thank, big thanks to Databricks for for inviting me and Slalom to to do some of this this presentation on some of this work that we've done together. And you know, it's been an absolute pleasure working with all of you, and this has been a fantastic experience. Yeah, and I was just going to thank you. Um, this was fun for us, so um, wanted to share 
uh, and yeah, keep, you know, reach out to us, the guy, Fr Franco, heck, myself and Austin and Danny, right? Reach out um, after this call, right? Let's just keep connecting. Um, we can help you out, definitely. Perfect. Well, then I think that's it for today. Again, thank you very much for attending this awesome session. Uh, and also, if you have questions, don't forget to go back to YouTube. Uh, you can ask us there, too. All right. So thanks very much, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.